Okay, without further ado, let's get started. I talked about the vector algebra already. So now I want to move into the equations of line and plane. Okay, okay. Okay, so the aim of this question, uh, this video is also, again, just talking about the formula and the skills rather than extensive uh, problem solving. So some of parts, some parts I will be skipping over because, uh, but then I typed a, uh, already a lot of parts for you, for your convenience. So I want you to go through the slides and uh, sometimes I'll be gibberish and hesitant to speak because it's pretty late in the evening, okay? But anyways, without further ado, let's get started. So one thing I want to remind you about the vector line equation, all this and all that, you really know from head to toe, right? How to deal with the line equations with the position vector and direction vector. Uh, one thing to clarify, I don't want you to use Cartesian form a lot when you're dealing with the vector line equation, right? Whenever you have a vector line equation, I want you to either use it to the vector form or parametric form to distinguish the uh, position vector as well as the direction vector. So when you look at this, you know, the, the common trap here is to use the direction vector uh, with the denominator, right? So you might say, okay, if I, disc if I call this as a line equation one and two, uh, the direction vector of the first line uh, may sound to be uh, three, one, two, and you know, the direction vector of the second kind might be, uh, you know, one, 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 right? Uh, but that's not true, right? For us, we want to really be, we want to be careful with the coefficient of your variable. I want you to make them into all one to claim, um, to find the denominator as the direction vector. So what I mean by that is the following. So if I look at the, you know, let me just quickly add a new page on it. Sure, so what I mean by that is uh, if I had this, you know, I'm going to change all the uh, coefficient to be one for each variable. So first part is fine, but for the second one, I would divide top and bottom by two. So y plus one over two over one over two. And then for the third one, I would divide it by negative three. So z minus four over three over two over three is what I've got. Then their uh, denominator is going to represent the direction vector for the first line equation. So, you know, boom. So three, one over two, and two, two over three. Okay, so, you know, you can use it, of course, but I prefer working with the uh, integer value for the direction vector. So you can use any vector that is parallel to it for finding uh, the angle. Um, so, you know, I just multiply by 6 on it. So 18, 3, and 4 will be the direction vector for the first line equation. And similarly speaking, you can see that, ah, okay, so it's going to be 135 divided by 3 on uh, both numerator and denominator, negative half, 1, okay? So I'm going to multiply by 6 on it, so 2, negative 3, 6. So I'm going to compare between these two direction vectors for the angle and make sure for the angle formula you're going to use the dot product, okay? However, yeah, you're right, um, you know, um, because we are dealing with the direction vector of the line equation, we don't know whether it's going to be acute or obtuse unless the question specifies we prefer working with the acute angle to so put an absolute value in the numerator, all right? Okay, that is great. Another thing that I want to mention about the line equation is working with the applications such as the kinematics, right? It's a bit different because we used to, uh, we've, been, we've been using the arbitrary constant with lambda or mu for all real. But now for the kinematics, I need to make sure that it, it depends on time Therefore, you need to make the velocity vector. Velocity vector usually comes what uh, the unit vector of the direction multiplied by the speed. So what I mean by that is the following. You know, if I look at this, you know what we now have uh, two reference uh, points here. And typically, right, if I was working with the vector line equation, this would have been just you know three. Oops, sorry. So let me create the position vector. So the vector line equation of that would have been 3, 4, 5 plus lambda. Oops, this would have been the direction vector, right? My bad. And just the position vector, something like that, right? But this wouldn't be the desired uh, uh, motion uh, vector because it did not specify the speed, right? So what you want to do is to make the direction vector as a unit vector, okay? That's what I'm going to do. So how do you make the unit vector? You're absolutely right. I want to divide this by the magnitude, right? So 3 square, 4 square, 5 square. So now the length is 1. Then the, what is it? Um, uh, the speed was 60. So I just multiply by 60 on it. And the time where time is in minutes, okay? Right. So that's how you distinguish with the, uh, the line equation and the uh, line of motion. Right? I think I specify here more clearly. So I want you to take a look, okay? 
And yeah, you know, then you, you, you get you get this type of interesting question. I think this is November 12, you know, if I'm not mistaken. And what I wanted to show you is that, sure, you know what? Um, for these uh, vector equations, those vector line equation might intersect, okay? So this line equation might intersect. However, they do have intersection point. They, they um, I don't know why it's so thick, uh, but it might not collide, you know? Because in order to, in order, in order for them to collide, you know, they need to have the same intersection at the same time. You know what I mean? But then, you know, this intersection may happen when t is equal to two and t is equal to three for both of them. However, as you can see, their time is different. They are not going to intersect. So, yeah, I really want you to uh, distinguish between the intersection and the collision for the line equation, especially in kinematics. Okay. And the next thing I want to talk about here, yeah, intersection, right? So intersection is always about what? Parametric form. It is always about the parametric form. So, you know, you just convert the line equation in the parametric form and you just compare with them, right? So if I want to find the intersection between 2 and 3, I just compare them parametrically, right? It is a uh, simultaneous equation with three variables. So x and y seems enough, isn't it? And after finding those parameters, you plug back into the z, and you need to make sure you're going to get the same z-component. If you don't, then it's a problem, right? They would not intersect. And, and, and depending on the direction vector, it might be defining skew lines. So make sure you try to work with the simultaneous equation a lot for the vector line intersection in parametric form. Easy peasy lemon squeeze. So I gave you I gave more point, points on that. But of course, you can talk about the intersection between line and the plane. No problem. Make sure, my friend, you put them into the parametric form. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let the x to be who? 4 plus 3 lambda, y to be negative 3, z to be 1 minus 2 lambda. You just put them in. You just put them in there. Then every all equations will be in terms of lambda. Then boom, you can find the parameter. Then you put it back into the parametric form. Then you can find the point of intersection between the plane and the line. Okay. So I've written down the equation here. I want you to go through, but the main essence of this part is that that for the line intersection between the line and line or line and plane, you make sure to put them into the parametric form. Easy peasy. Lemon squeezy. Oh, this is a very, very nice question because it's a little, uh, it's, a, it's a bit more interesting. This is more interesting. What I mean by that is that you're supposed to find a vector line equation that goes past through the who? B and R. Okay, like that. Right, that is great. Sure. So for that, I've got a position vector B. Right, that's great. I got a parametric form. So parameter, sorry, and then uh, the direction vector is going to be. I want to go from O uh, B to R. So for that, I would take this direction. Doesn't matter. You could have taken that direction. Doesn't really matter. Okay. So you know, if I want to go to B to A, I'm going to subtract from the uh, the the destination with the departing point. So it's going to be A minus B. Right. Plus. Uh, to go to AR, it's a midpoint, so it's going to be C minus A over 2. So if I add them together, it's going to give you A over 2 minus B plus C over 2. So that, my friend, is my direction vector, so I'm going to put it right there. Okay, so that's great. And you can do the same thing for the, what is it, um, uh, AQ vector. So let me quickly get that for you. So for that, I would do A uh, plus, you know, they asked me to put the parameter mu, and then you know, for me to go to AQ, so I would go AC and then CQ. So that would have been C minus A over 2 plus U and B minus C over 2. So if I combine it together, oops, I don't know why I divided by 2. It's just um, my tiredness. Uh, here then I have a C over 2 minus A plus B over 2. So that is the direction vector of AQ. That is great. So I'm going to plug it in right here. Okay, so that's great. So I've got these two line equation, and you know what? They asked me to find the intersection. But this is a this is a bit interesting, isn't it? This is a bit interesting. Because so far we had some components on the vector line equation so that we can work the simultaneous equation for finding the intersection. You know what I mean? Right. But unfortunately for these forms, I don't have any components to work simultaneously in parametric form. I wonder how I can do so. Well, no panic. What we can do is to uh, distribute this and factorize in a different way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift all this to the left hand side, but instead of this time, instead of grouping by the lambda mu, I'm going to group by a, b, c. So let's try to group by the a, right? So that case, 
I'm going to have a lambda over 2 minus 1 from the right hand side and that would have come out as a plus uh, t -t 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 mu, isn't it? I think so, right? Uh, plus B vector, um, I'm going to factorize. So, you know, let me try to use different highlighter to factorize B. Uh, that that one would have been, a, what is it? T -t 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 negative, oops, sorry. 1 uh, minus lambda and then t -t 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 minus mu over 2. Right? So that is what I have. Okay, that's great. And then I'm going to factorize by C. If I did, it's going to be who? Do, 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 lambda over 2 minus mu over 2. And that must be equal to 0. Right. So, you know, A, B, C were given non-zero vector. So in order for them to become 0, their coefficients must be all 0, isn't it? So I can actually make a simultaneous equation in terms of lambda. That is brilliant. And for that part, I have lambda is equal to mu. Then obviously you can put it back in and find the uh, parameter accordingly. I believe it was uh, something like um, 2 third wasn't it? I don't know. I'm not too sure. But why is it better? Because now I can put it back into the one of the line equations to find the intersection. So if I let the lambda to be uh, 2 third, you know, what do you get? I get the b, uh, 2 third, da da da, a over 2. You know, I can't be bothered to indicate the vector uh, symbol with the arrow, but please, you got to indicate. I'm not going to right now uh, because I'm in a rush. But uh, 1 over 3, a, sure, and 2 through. You know, it was a negative two third one, so plus one third b, very good one third c vector. So now I have that. It's called the center of mass, right? Sure. So you know, one of those proving questions with the, without the components on the x, y, z, no problem. I can still work simultaneously, but in terms of parameter. Okay, that's good. So now let's move into the next part. All right, let's get going with more equation formula for the vector. I love this formula. Okay, I want you to memorize it, but also proof is examinable. Okay, uh, but I'm more interested in about the uh, 3D case. So this is the distance, uh, the distance, shortest distance formula from a point to a line. Okay, uh, and you know what? Why not? You know, let's prove it. You know, I don't want to rush things. I know it's quite late and you guys are taking an exam soon, but also, you know, taking a bit of time to prove things always helps uh, your understanding. Okay, so... Uh, per vector, whenever you want to solve, I love visualizing. Okay, I want you to visualize. What I mean by that is the following. So, you know, I've got a point and a line equation. Okay, so let's say I've got a A and a B. Oh, you know what? Yeah, actually, let me just call it as a position vector and direction vector. And then let's say the external point was a P. Uh, X, oh, I don't want to write X, uh, P, Q, R. How about that? And I wanted to find the shortest distance. But shortest implies what? Perpendicular, isn't it? Um, so I probably have to deal with a right angle. You know what I mean? All right, that's great. So perpendicular is what I want. And what I can do is, so suppose that this was my position vector, okay? And um, let me call it the point A, which represents the position vector. And this, I can get the AP, right? So that will be um, just difference between the P and A. Uh, it's going to be, let me call the position vector as a A1, A2, A3. And if I subtract, uh, it's going to be P minus A1, uh, P minus, sorry, Q minus A2, R minus A3. Okay, that's got the AP vector. And you can find the magnitude, obviously, right? So using the distance formula, right angle, theta, oh la la. Right, so we got the, what is it? Um, right angle triangle. Every time you have right angle triangle, I want you to use Sokatoa. You know what I'm saying? That's great. And our uh, aim is to find that shortest distance. Oh, I've got the opposite. Hypotenuse, boom. It's going to be sine theta. What is it? Uh, D over magnitude of AP. Okay, that's great. All right, then D is going to be modulus of AP and sine theta. But you know what? I do not like this formula why not i have to deal with the angle i don't like it but if you think about you know s just sit back and think about any vector formula that involves with the uh, sine theta I is there any operation that you can think of you're absolutely right that way you know that it's something to do with the cross product and so you know maybe i would just arbitrarily multiply by the no another known vector the direction vector so you know let me just multiply the magnitude of the direction vector arbitrarily but, you know, I don't want to change anything, so I'm going to divide that. Aha! Uh -huh. Now you realize the numerator is going to be simply just to... Very good. 
uh, the magnitude of cross product that we already have learned right that's great um oops you know i don't want to meddle oh that, that's okay yeah it's correct bonus of this so this is a great formula because i don't need to find the angle and then it uses the uh, again the given external point and position vector direction vector so with all those known vectors you can find the shortest distance or oh, please be able to prove it okay you just have to multiply the extra line and it's very very useful later on okay so now yeah you can use it you know i've got an external point and a line equation here you know one of the typical way other than using that formula you know let me quickly show you that also um, you put the point on a line that would make a shortest line, shortest distance to that external point. I would put that in a parametric form. And then what you can do is, let me call it, I wouldn't call it A, but let me call it maybe uh, a Q and P. Then you can get a PQ vector in terms of T, right? And, you know, uh, shortest implies the perpendicular. So you want to do the dot product with what? Uh, the, the direction vector of the line equation here, which is the just the coefficient of the parameter, such as 2, 3, 1, should be equal to 0. So from here, you're going to find the t, and there, you're going to now put it back into the pq, and then find their distance, blah, blah, blah. But of course, obviously, you know, it's a lot better if you simply just use what that formula that we have just discussed, okay? So make sure you'll be able to work with the uh, shortest distance formula for the uh, uh, shortest distance for the, between the point and a line equation. Okay, you know, another thing that I like to talk about here was uh, previously I was talking about what line equation, right? And it is really just a study of a parametric and um, simultaneous. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is that uh, if you look at this equation, I think that one of the first things is that the skew so I think it's pretty obvious because it's not parallel because the direction vectors are not constant multiple of each other. And, you know, if I want to make the, uh, the, inter uh, the, the intersection, I see that the x, y components are already the same for the position vectors. I claim that lambda and mu has to be zero, but then the z components are different. So it's not intersecting. So neither parallel nor intersecting. I know it's a skew. You should see that already. And it says find the perpendicular vector for, for to both lines, and we know that it needs to be something with the cross product. So yeah, sure, you know I'm gonna do negative one one two cross two one six. I, I would leave it as an exercise. Let's suppose I found the normal vector, right? It says hence determine the equation of a line L three that is a perpendicular to both L one and L two. So the reason I came up with this example is because. Every time you're dealing with the vector, I really want you to do what? Thank you. Visualize. I want you to visualize all the time. And the best way for me to visualize the skew line is simply just draw the cuboid. It's not that great. Oh, okay. It's actually quite nice. Just simply draw the cuboid, will you? Right? That is great. And then, just, you know, look at these two lines. You know, they're skew. You know, it's neither parallel nor intersecting. So visually, it's more obvious to me what the equation looks like, okay? And furthermore, you know, it says uh, uh, what we're trying to do is another line equation that is a perpendicular to both and L2. So I know L3 is going to be what? Parallel to who? Thank you. The normal vector. So I already have a normal vector. So, you know, of its constant multiple, it must be same as that uh, uh, the direction vector of the line equation, right? Sure, sure. I want to come up with that equation. But how would you like to come up with the direction vector? If you ask me, sure, I will use the two coordinates on the line equations and subtract them but I don't know the point maybe maybe I can describe that in the parametric form right so if I just get the coordinate unknown coordinate again if you have unknown coordinate on line equation please use what parametric form thank you so I'm gonna have one minus lambda two plus lambda two plus two lambda and then the second one is gonna be who one plus two mu two plus mu four plus six mu and what we want to do is to what uh, make a direction vector between them so i'm going to subtract is what i'm saying right very good so it's going to be who two mu plus lambda you know i'm just subtracting mu minus lambda and uh, if you subtract that what do you get uh six mu uh minus two lambda plus four and that my friend must be same as the multiple of the normal vector and you can work simultaneously why because you got the three unknown parameter for the three equations so you should be able to solve it simultaneously. So the essence of this problem is that you being able to always put it into the parametric form of the unknown coordinates on the line equation. And also furthermore, if you got the case of skew, please just visualize the cuboid 
and then work more visually. Okay, so this is the answer. I will leave it as an exercise, but very, very nice problem. Plane equation, I'm not going to go over how to derive a Cartesian form of a plane equation. Please make sure that you're able to do the, you know, the um, cross product and all that. But I would, I would like to more talk about the application. So yeah, you know, so angle between a line and a plane, uh, you know the formula. It is the direction vector, normal vector. I want to deal with the acute and their magnitude. However, in this time, it ain't cosine, it's a sine, okay? And it's because of the, we are looking for the angle between who line and a normal vector first and then use the complementary angle so it, the cosine becomes a sine and then one more thing that I want to mention here is that if you want to find the plane uh, and line are perpendicular that means their normal vector and direction vectors is parallel if plane and uh, line is parallel uh, their normal vector and direction must be perpendicular Make sure you are aware of that, and that's that. You know, I I don't have much to say for the uh, the angle between the plane and the line. Just make sure you are able to find the normal vector from the coefficient of the Cartesian form of the plane equation, and direction vector from the line equation. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Okay, but more, I'm way more interested in about who you're right, the plane intersection, right? And two planes, uh, you know, visualization of those intersections looks like that. Obviously, this is the more of the intersection that we are interested in. And the one one thing that I want to remind you is that the direction vector of an intersection, right, is the cross product of the normal vectors. So what it means is that you know you can actually verify the direction vector of the line equation. You know, supposedly, uh, suppose let's say we found the direction. Vector vector of the intersection between two planes using the row reduction. And if you want to verify, just simply put a dot product between the direction vector and normal vector. It must be zero. Okay, so this is a very nice way of verifying your result. You know, vector is linear algebra. It's going to involve a lot of a computation, right? Uh, in the linear combination of all those nasty coefficients, sometimes the numbers might not look viable, but it's okay. It's verifiable. Right, make sure you know you know the tools to verify whether your answer is correct or not. That's a very very important, especially for the vector. Okay, so you know, so this visualization of that case. So easy peasy, lemon squeezy. And sure, you know, please make make yourself aware of what working with the uh, finding the intersection line between two or three planes using the row reduction. Right, it's a procedure of metrics and. Right, so you know I've done this already for you. Uh, so if I got a vector equation, remember you just write down the coefficient and con constant part, and I'm using some row reduction to get rid of a variable. But here's the thing: you do not have to make the x component zero all the time. It can be any component. So here, for me, it was clear that it, getting rid of the z component was simpler. So uh, I just uh, did this row reduction to reduce the z component here. So now I've got 3x plus y is equal to 3. And I'm going to choose my arbitrary constant maybe with the uh, what x. Okay, You can choose any variable as your arbitrary constant. You don't have to choose only for the z. It just depends which one seems to be an easier case to get rid of. And then, you know, by letting the x to be lambda, then I can let lambda here to find the parametric form of a y, and then you're gonna put all these two into the first equation to find the z in terms of lambda, isn't it? So blah blah blah. I've done it for you. So I claim this is my intersection for the planes. Okay. But here's the thing, you know, I don't want to stop there. Every time you claim an answer, please know one way or the other to verify whether this is a correct answer or not, right? And I think to, 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 to check with the position vector is pretty simple. Right now, I've got the position vector of ooh, 0, 3, and negative 4. You simply just put it back there. You know what I mean? So if I apply in the first equation, I've got the 0, 6, uh, minus 4. I do get constant, too. I'm very happy. I'm sure it's going to be the likewise for the second time, second plane. The next thing I'm going to do is maybe I'm going to work with the direction vector. I have 1, negative 3, and 5. And I know this direction vector must be perpendicular to both of those normal vectors, right? So that means I'm going to maybe dot product with one of the normal vectors. Let, let's try with the second one, why not? I have a two, negative one, negative one, and let's see if it does give you zero. So if it's, it's if I do the dot product, I have a two, three, minus five, yes, I do get zero, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Okay, so make sure after you compute, you know a way to verify. It's, ver it's especially, especially important for a vector. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, so blah, blah, blah. Sure, you know, this is also a very great, very great example. I think doing the row reduction, especially when you have some unknown parameter, is not an easy case, okay? So you just want to verify, you know, 
just want to verify it. So if this is a correct position vector, it should work uh, for both planes by plugging in. So I do get 2 and K if you just plug this position vector. Please try yourself. And how would you verify this direction vector? You're absolutely right. I'm going to just put a dot product with normal vector 1, normal vector 2, and see myself if it becomes 0. Okay, please know how to verify. And yes, and, and then the and, and the big boss. What is a big boss? Uh, for the plan equation of three plan equa intersection. There are many, many cases, but these are the visualization. Unique solution here, no solution, and infinitely many solutions. Given as what? As a point, uh, no solution, and line. Okay, so let's see how we can get them. So yeah, you know, typically you do the row reduction, don't you? And uh, it's something that you practice already in the, for the two planes. You do the, you apply the something similar. So if I could apply the row reduction here for you, I already have computed here for me. Uh, the first aim was to get rid of the x component. I have done that. That's great. Please, you know, if it's if it sounds too fast in the video, no problem. Pause it and see yourself if you can actually compute. Okay, this is really just a last minute revision for you to check your skills is what I'm trying to embed it in you, all right? And what do you do next? Yeah, sure, I'm gonna get rid of the next component. Uh, it can be either Y or Z on the last row, doesn't matter, right? It just depends on which one is gonna be easier to work with. So I've done the, uh, the I've got rid of who here, you know what, I got rid of the Z component in the second row, doesn't matter. As long as I have one component each, I'm good to go, right? This is algebraically much easier to get rid of than, than for example, Y, you know, because I got to multiply by, what is it, uh, you know, a 4 over 5 on here on each term to cancel out with the, Z, uh, the Y component there. I don't want that. It sounds too nasty. Instead, I just multiply by 3 on the third row and then just add it into the second because it's going to get rid of the Z component there right away. But yeah, I'm, I lo I'm loving it. So here, I've got the negative 17Y is equal to negative 68. Therefore, I've got the Y equal to 4, right? Very good. What I can do is just, you know, just plug back in. So it's going to be negative 16, isn't it? Minus Z, it's going to be negative 15. Z is going to be negative 1. Easy peasy, I'm a squeezy. So it's going to be a unique solution. Very good. Uh, let's have a look at the next example. Is that the same one? I don't think so. So, you know, I've done the row reduction here. Oh, oh la la. The second and third row uh, happens to be the same. No problem. I can just get rid of it because it's the same multiple. So it's going to be just a 0, 0, 0, 0. What does this remind you? It reminds you a very similar case with the intersection between two planes. And what was very important? You're absolutely right. R, oops. R, maybe it's too zoomed in. Let me change the boldness. Yeah, there you go. R, R, bit. You can choose any variable and claim that to be lambda, right? So for this one, what, what have I done? I let the Z to be lambda. Remember, you can you could have claimed for the Y, right? It does matter. And then you're just trying to find each component in terms of that parameter, which is going to end up being a parametric equation of line intersection between three planes, okay? So I've got it for you. I've got the X, I've got the Y, I've got the Z. And you know what? For the direction vector, I got some rational number. doesn't matter. You can make it into the integer form by multiplying some integer. And as long as it's parallel, that's a good use, okay? It's great. And make sure you're able to verify whether that position vector and direction vector is going to be great. Just plug back in for the position vector and see yourself if you get the same constant. For the direction vector, what do you do? You tell me. You're absolutely right. I'm just going to do the dot product of that direction vector with who? One of the, uh, each of the normal vector and see it becomes zero. Okay, that's what I want to check. That is correct. Easy peasy. I'm squeezy. But sure, you know what? The, here's the thing. You know, I, I think I mentioned it in the topic one when we were working with the simultaneous equations. I, I, I slightly mentioned about, okay, you know, this is a more popular example in vector. Same thing. I don't want you to just know the row reduction. I know. You might say, oh, it's not in service. It's a determinant. Well, do I need to know? Well, come on. You, know, you have done the cross product, which is basically the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix. If you have some tools that's going to uh, increase your efficiency of solution solving problems, please be open to learn it. Okay? Be open to learn it. So what I want you to do here is, sure, we talked about already, right, determinant of the matrix. If it ain't zero, we know it's a unique solution. If it's a zero, then it's non-unique. And here's the thing, you're right, I do not know, okay, whether it's going to be infinitely many or no solution. I don't know that. That you have to verify with the raw reduction. But it's a much easier to find the A using the determinant, okay? So let's get to it. So sure, you know what, let's get the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix or of those coefficients, you know. Let me just zoom out to compare. I've got the A to 1, boom, negative 1, A plus 1, 3. 
negative 2, 1, a plus 2. So I've just got the 3 by 3 matrix. I've just applied the determinant like a cross product. Remember, cross product was just the i, j, k. But in this time, I just replaced it with the coefficient of who? Uh, uh, the variables in the first plan equation. Okay, it's the same thing. It's going to alternate, blah, blah, blah. I've got this nice little cubic polynomial. And, and I want to see which one makes it 0, which is going to be singular. That means you're not going to have a unique solution. I want to be careful with those a value. And, you know, for the cubic formula, sorry, cubic equation, we don't learn the cubic formula, but you learn something called what? Rational root test, don't you? Sure. Um, um, a n, x of n, a naught is equal to zero if your root is rational. It doesn't have to be, of course. It is, this is a test. It's not a theorem. It doesn't give you the answer all the time. But it's a nice way to check, verify um, whether the solution is going to be who, given as was rational number. So for me, I'm going to plug what a is equal to plus minus 1, 7 over 1. And yes, I'm going to just plug it in 1 and 7 and see if it becomes a 0. Then boom, it does become 0 when a is equal to 1. Then I can factorize it, right, with the a minus 1 linear factor. Then I got a quadratic term. Determine, uh, sorry, discriminant is a negative, so I don't bother finding the solution there. Just a being 1 will give you a non-unique case. Why? Can you please talk to yourself? Why? a equal to 1 here suggests that you're not going to have a unique solution. You're absolutely right because the determinant of that matrix was what? 0. And what's the another dilemma here? You're absolutely right. I do not know whether this is a no solution or infinite, infinite many solutions like an line intersection. You're absolutely right. So we check. Let's verify. Okay, we, this does not guarantee we have a line no solution. That you need to check with the row reduction. But you know, now you have an A, it's a lot easier to check. Okay, let's see. So I plug, I plug A back into the equation. I've got this nice little uh, matrix augmented form. So as you can see, check this out. You know, after having got rid of the coefficient of x, I've got this. And you know, think about yourself. You know, think to yourself, I want, for example, let's say I want to find k, all right, that I will have an infinite many solution. And you know that one of the row has to be all zero. But but as you can see, you know, for the second row, you can simplify further. If I just divide by the common factor four, it just becomes one, 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 doesn't it? And then, yes, in order for third row to be entirely zero, it needs to be constant multiple of the second row. So I got five, five in, in order for it to be got rid of by the constant multiple of the second row is to be end up being 5 as well. This suggests k is min minus 1. Minus 1. Okay. Minus 1. So there you go. That in, If k was negative 1, then boom, I've got all 0. That is a great. I now have what? Uh, uh, the, the, the very similar row reduced form for the line intersection. You know what I'm saying? That's great. So then we just apply the same thing that we did. You know, you know I left that as homework. But, you know, let's try. Let's try. Why not? It's the last example that I'm going to talk about, so why not? Okay. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So it's going to be, you know, y da -da -da -da. plus lambda is equal to 1. Therefore, y is equal to 1 minus lambda. That's great. So I've got the parametric form of y and z, which you can plug it in back into the who? First row. Let's use that. So x plus 2, y, 1 minus lambda plus lambda is equal to 3. That's great. Let's expand. So it's going to be x plus 2 minus 2 lambda plus lambda is equal to 3. Okay, that is great. So now x is equal to who? 1 plus lambda is what I have. I've got the x, y, z in terms of lambda. Those are the parametric form. That's great. So it's going to be 1, 1, 0 plus lambda, 1, negative 1, 1. Okay, how do I check whether that's going to be a good um, direction vector? I'm going to Put it in what may be the uh, dot product with the uh, normal vector and see if it becomes a zero because the direction of the line intersection must be perpendicular to all of the normal vectors, right? Very good. So one to one dot one negative one doesn't make a zero. Let's see one minus two plus one. Boom, it does become zero. I'm very, very happy. Okay, so you know, these are the row here, these are, these are the crosswords. If you know, you know, all the intersection between angle, intersection distance, between line, line, line plane, and planet plane, you are good to go. You are good to go. I believe that my, I should have written down the formula for the, what is it, the shortest distance between the plane and the point. I don't think it's, 
been added in this slide uh, for which i can just talk about right now let me just talk about it right now oh okay it's right here but um i don't think i have mentioned i managed to show deriving so let me quickly show you here adding by adding the next slide so let me quickly show you that so another nice formula that you could memorize is that shortest distance point <coughs> sorry between a point and a plane so what i want you to do is this okay right shortest something always about the perpendicular what you can do is suppose that this is ax plus by plus cz is equal to k and let's say i've got the p p1 p2 p3 you can find the line equation right because i've uh what is it the position vector and then the direction vector because if a line is a perpendicular to the plane it means direction vector must be parallel to the normal vector we talked about that above didn't we so now i know this direction vector is going to be a b c okay that's great so now what you can do is to find the intersection between a line and a plane well remember uh intersection is always about what parametric form so you know i'm going to put this as a parametric form and what do you do i'm going to put that into the plane equation right a p1 plus a lambda uh, plus b uh, p2 plus b lambda blah 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 is equal to k so now you see it's an equation in terms of lambda <coughs> sorry so now you can find the lambda here and then what do you do put it back into the line equation to find the point there then you can use the distance formula to find the pq for me it's very confusing although this is the most popular method right but also you can use some geometry to derive another formula is this is what i'm saying so let me get that picture once again so what i'm what i want to do is to um, use the right angle triangle once again what i mean by that is the following suppose i've got the uh, ax plus by plus cz is equal to k okay so the plane equation and on here what i want you to do is that try to just draw arbitrarily right angle triangle like that okay which this is coming from a position vector and you know what if you ask me how do i find the position vector well just pluck any value is fine right so i'm gonna maybe just call it um k over a comma zero comma zero you know that was a position vector on the plane because if you pluck them in you get k no problem okay that's great and, and i'm gonna call it maybe q okay point coordinate q then that's great so because you can get the pq vector right by subtracting these two and i can get their magnitude right and what i'm interested in right now is ooh, you're absolutely right i'm interested in about the uh the shortest distance between them and in this right angle triangle has got the angle theta there right so what i can do is you know from this i've got the adjacent and hypotenuse i can use a cosine right so now i know d is ooh, modulus of pq uh times cosine theta but here's the thing yeah you know it's a very similar to the shortest distance between a point and a line now I'm looking at cosine and vector. This requires me to find the angle. I don't like it. But instead, I want to find a vector operation that I can convert the cosine into something algebraic. And that is what product? The top product. And here is what is another known vector. I know the normal vector is known here as ABC. That's great. So I'm going to put the modulus of normal here divided by modulus of normal there. Okay. Well, it's, you know, I'm just this is just multiplied by one it doesn't change anything however beautifully summarize the numerator to be who the product doesn't it right that's great so this is going to be the distance shortest distance formula between point and a plane and knowing this formula really helps a lot why because yeah sure you can find the um distance between point and a plane you can also find between point and a plane and a plane because you just have to find the position vector of another plane and use the same formula and also uh, this can help okay this can help to find um, between line and a plane okay for which I will leave it as an exercise but very very good application so knowing this shortest distance formula between point and a line and a point and a plane is also definitely going to help uh, you to increase the efficiency of solving problem the next video should involve now uh, with who statistic starting with the sampling method that I will do it next time okay I hope, like me, you go through in the middle of night, still revising for mathematics, aiming high for seven, right? So please uh, do not, do not uh, pause until you reach the le level. Only a few weeks left. Let's get some motivation, okay? That's it for me today. I will see you next time. Okay, before we continue to the other topic, what I also wanted to talk about is the, to discuss more examples with vector, right? And another uh, popular example is the mirror image, the ones in the reflection. 
So what you want to do is that I will just visualize the plan equation and I notice that this point is not on the plan. Why not? Because if you just plug it in, you wouldn't get one. Right, so that I know it's an external point. And what I wanted to find was the its mirror image. And how you can find so is that uh, maybe you're gonna find out um, from the vector line equation. And again, every time you have an unknown point, I want you to try to describe that as a parametric equation of a line. So what I mean by that is the uh, you know, for that line equation, I'm going to maybe use the position vector as a, so 3, 1, 2 plus lambda. And then what's going to be the direction vector? It's going to be perpendicular to the plane, that means it's a parallel to the normal vector, 1 to 1, right? So that's great. Okay, then you what you want to do is to find the intersection between the line and the plane. What we can do is just put the parametric form, so 3 plus lambda, 1 plus 2 lambda, 2 plus lambda, into the plan equation. So it's going to be 3 plus lambda, um, what is it, 2 times 1 plus 2 lambda plus uh, 2 plus lambda is equal to 1. And then we can find the lambda from there. What we can do next is simply uh, use that lambda. If suppose I don't know, suppose it was five, then for the mirror image, you just have to go the same distance, so it would have been just ten. So make sure you are aware of the uh, mirror image. What you want to do then is to simply double the parameter that you found from a point to the plane, which I can then go another mirror image for the next. Okay, so this is the distance formula that I was talking about from a point to the plane. Make sure you know how we derive it, how have we derived it uh, using the normal vector there and then from the position vector of a plane we can make a right angle and then you know if distance d and then maybe I can make the vector here get a magnitude and deal with the cosine and use the dot product, yes, then I can make it into the following equation. So very, very neat uh, formula for finding the distance between a point and a plane. So you can see the actual application in this slide, you know, whatever you want to, uh, if you want to verify with the extensive work, make sure you refer to the slide. You know, for me, it's just pointing out which formula is important especially for the vector plane. Yes, and I can use it for uh, between planes as well because what you can do is just use the formula between an arbitrarily, an, an arbitrarily um, position, position vector on, on, the, on the plane and then use the formula according for the next plane. Okay, so yeah, you know, but here's the thing, I think it's very hard to summarize a vector. You know why? Because things are always going to become in the combination of many, many things, right? Vector is a very popular question for section B simply because of that nature that it can contain most of everything almost everything that you have learned on the vector so let's go through uh, some of the questions um, on the exam and see what I mean by that right so it's very important for you to indicate next to the question oh, okay this is about that right what I mean by that is uh, oh, okay so this is just uh, getting the vector from the coordinates but I gotta be careful is our subject b with a from from b to a, so it's gonna be b minus a for the a b vector. Cross product, I gotta be careful with the cross product with the order and order and all. And if you found your normal vector and you wanna verify, maybe I would just quickly check with who dot, dot product and make make it sure that it's a zero. So we can do that, right? That's great. And yes, you know, for the area, it's just uh, using the cross product formula, isn't it? Absolute value. And then the getting the magnitude of the normal vector is what we want. Yeah, sure, I can use a normal vector and who x y z and then normal vector with the position vector is what I want. Yes, and you know perpendicular to the plane. That means for my line equation, it's going to be parallel to the direction vector. So I can use what is it? Um, the normal vector as the direction vector for the line equation distance d from the plane so yeah sure just like we talked about before maybe I will use a parametric form of a line equation applied to the plane get the parameter and get the point of intersection then boom you can find the distance right and the unit vector perpendicular to the plane sure unit vector what is it whatever whatever the vector was I'm gonna divide by its magnitude but there you go right the reflection we just talked about it right so whatever the parameter you found from that point d you can just double that uh, lambda 
to find the image. So as you can see, it's very collective, right? The, the vector question section be very collective. Sure, same thing here. We can figure out the uh, normal vector, no problem. Area, 1 over 2, magnitude of that normal vector, easy peasy, m is easy, Cartesian equation of the plane, sure, no problem. You know, if you got all the coordinates here, you can get the one position vector, and what else? Two unparalleled direction vector, make sure you have a two unparalleled direction vectors, then yes, you can get the normal vector, and then coming up with who? x plus by, cz equal to k is a plan equation. Cartesian equation of a line, make sure it looks very fancy, right? And that you're able to describe it, okay? And determine the coordinate of p, yeah, just put it into the parametric form, and then um, put it into the uh, plan equation, and you're good to go. Same thing. Okay, so very collective. It can be a mixture of the dot product, cross product, line equation, plan equation, but do not panning at the end of the day. It is just linear algebra. Things are very simple. But I think what is hard is being able to translate. Okay, you know, it's asking me for the angle. Am I able to come up with the right formula? It is asking me for the distance. Can I come up with the right formula? Is it the distance between point and a line, point and a plane, distance between skew lines, etc. So that is what they're checking, whether you are able to come up with the right formula. It is really just about the translation skills. Now let's move on to... Topic four, sure, you know, I think a lot of people forget to uh, memorize this. Make sure you know what sort of a sampling you have, okay, so on, on your statistic. So I just uh, uh, attached a uh, slide uh, that describes all the sampling and sampling method. Make sure you read through, right? So it's going to be, it could be given as a one or two points question in the beginning of the statistic problem says, okay, which sampling method this is. If you're not able to refer to the name in particular, that's, that's no good, right? Make sure you know, you memorize all this sampling method, okay? Yeah, you know, for descriptive stats, you know, working like a whisker plot for the discrete variables and, you know, for the group data with the continuous, we're going to use cumulative frequency. I think it's something that you should be aware, right? It's something that you are very comfortable with. But for me, I want to talk about like the exam skills, right? I want to talk about the exam skills. One thing that I want to remind you is that the algebra of expected value and variance, what I mean by that is, uh, don't forget, expected value of a x, x is the random variable. We know it's going to become as a e of x plus b, and what was the variance? Um, sure, it was a, a square uh, variance of x, right? Make sure that the con any constant b to the variable does not change the variance. And, um, and uh, standard deviation of a x plus b is going to be absolute value of, value of a standard deviation of x. Is what we do. So if I quickly see this, you know, I got the total sum of samples, got 10 of them, so the mean is who? M25.2, right? It's a 5% let, so what you do is you multiply 0 0.95 on each sample, right? So that I know that the new mean is going to be what? Uh, 0 0.95 times 25.2. And then a uh, new variance is going to be, remember, if you multiply a constant uh, factor to the variable for the variance, you got to square it. So it's going to be 0 0.95 squared times U, 25 from the 5 standard deviation is how we do. Okay. Oh, sure. One more thing that I want to uh, indicate for the descriptive stats is that you are aware, my friend, is the formula. Okay. Sure, you know, the mean was just adding all this, right? And then divided by 5, that's one equation, which is given to be 8, okay? Uh, but for variance, uh, there are two formula, right? So the variance, uh, either you can do the average area of square or sum of squares of the samples minus the mu square. And the second version is used a lot for solving simultaneously, okay? And, and, and that's the one that I'm going to use for deriving the secondary equation, meaning it's going to be 2 square, x square, y square, 10 square, 17 square, over 5, my, minus 2. The mean was uh, 8, so 64 is going to be 27.6. Sure, so we're going to, you know, as you can see, work uh, simultaneously from there then, right? I will leave it as an exercise, but make sure you are, a you are able to use the second version of the variance for the algebraic approach for the variance problem. Okay, yeah, another thing, uh, what is the outlier? Okay, I will leave this one as exercise. Excellent, excellent question. Sure, so here they define the first quartile as U, N plus 1, 
over fourth piece of data. So, uh, so you know, it's going to be one over four, and then uh, five plus one. So I have a three over two. So that's gonna be between uh, second. Oops, sorry, first and second. So that's gonna be um, x one plus x two over two, and likewise, it's gonna be three over four. Uh, five plus one for the third quartile, isn't it? So. I have a 3 times 6 over 4, then um, I have a 9 over 2, so that's between 4th and 5th. So it's going to be x4, 5 over 2, that's the third quartile. And, you know, then the um, interquartile range is who the difference between them, isn't it? And then remember the formula, my friend. Remember the formula for the outlier, right? So, boom, so that is the interquartile range. If you remember, if I just visualize the whisker plot and indicate where the outliers are, here, here, right? So that outlier upper bound is defined by what? Q3 uh, plus 1.5 and then the integral time range. And what they're asking is, okay, set up set with only five numbers in it cannot have any outliers. It's a proof question, right? So this type of question can arise as well using the definition. So please try to attempt yourself. What I want to show you here is that to remind you about the outlier formula, right? And how to get the first quartile, third quartile in the uh, discrete data. Okay, please check it, check this one. It's a very, very nice problem. Sure, you know, on the bivariate modeling, uh, there, is, there isn't much for me to discuss other than the x against y, y against x. So, um, and the interpolation. Sure, let's talk about it. So in the revision, please make sure you are aware of the difference between the x against y, y against x, because typically what you learn is the y against x, isn't it? You try to get the equation y against x. And that's the normal practice that we had done. You know, you usually create two columns, don't you? And then apply the linear regression and talk about its coefficient and etc. But sometimes you have to do the x against y. And if you ask me what, when, well, it depends, really. It depends. Uh, you know, suppose I was given the data like that. And then let's say these were like nasty decimal places. And then let's say this is a, a good integer values. So that could imply that you might have to work with the uh, x against y. Or if you are using y value to approximate the x value, then I will use the x against y. And how we can create the x against the y on the calculators is that you simply have to change the column, right? Because uh, in the calculator, they always give you y is equal to mx plus c whenever you do the linear regression. So in order for you to change that, it simply change the, the column or change the data that you, what you're going to use for the input and output, right? So this, even though you are applying y equal to mx plus c, regression on this, you know fundamentally this is the same as x equal to my plus c. You can make sure you know how to distinguish between the y against x and x against y. And also, yeah, you know, sometimes in the bivariate modeling, they're going to say, okay, is this result accurate? You know, is, this, is your approximation a relevant approach? And you can say, oh, yeah, sure. You know, suppose I've got a line equation like that. And then, you know, if you're trying to approximate the data within the, within the set, Will be the interpolation. However, if it's off the set, it's going to be extrapolation. So just give, be able to uh, give a simple reason why this bivariate modeling will be an accurate approach or not. Okay, sure. But my favorite on the topic four is a theoretical probability. So what I would say is really, it's really just um, simultaneous equation. What I mean by that is they are asking whether you are able to come up with the right formula and be able to substitute it. Is what you are doing. And what you should be considering is for the theoretical probability, I don't like union. I don't like it. I do not like complement either. We don't like it. What we like is intersection or just a single event. Um, sure, I don't like conditional probability as well. So what I mean by that is uh, you really want to convert them using, using certain laws, right, is, is what I'm saying. So let's talk about it. So let's talk about certain rules that you should memorize, okay? And I think these are uh, this is a great example um, because while proving it, you're really learning all the skills. So what I mean by that is the following. So you know I've I've attached all the work here, but I would I actually kind of want to write this one down. So let me just okay add a new page. All right, let's have a look. So what I want to do here is A B are independent. So it is given, isn't it? If that's the given information, you can write simply probability of A 
intersection B is probability of A and probability of B. Oh, by the way, I said learning laws are important, right? So additional rule, uh, probability of, I'm just going to write it here first before we continue, okay? So that you know you are aware of what rules we're going to use. I don't like union, so it's going to be probability of A, probability of B, probability of A, intersection B. I don't like uh, complement either, so intersection B prime is the pure part of A, so A minus intersection B. And what else do you not like? Um, I don't like conditioner, so probability of who? A, intersection B, over probability of B. You do like uh, intersection, however, you are still you are also able to convert using the conditional probability will be given as probability of who? A given B times probability of B, or probability of B given A times probability of A is what I've got. And what else? Uh, probability of A union B complement, probability of A complement intersection B complement, and yeah, finally, I think this is a very, very important rule, law of tar total probability. So probability of B is the same as U, um, B and A, or B and A prime. And that will be given as a probability of U, uh, B given A times A, or B given A prime times probability of A prime. Okay, very, very important rule. It's, a, it's very popular for the exam. So I think that's sort of a summarize it. Okay. But anyway, so I, I want to use one of them when I'm working with the probability algebra. So it's really like a simultaneous equation. You just have to know where to substitute with what. Okay, so because it was independent, I'm going to use that free information. And my aim here is to prove this. And here's the thing, you know, for me, whenever I have to prove independence, maybe it's going to be better to show this version of independence. What is? Probability of A given B prime is probability of B. Okay, that's the aim. I can't use it because something that I need to prove. So I'm going to start with one side. Maybe I'm going to start with this side. And uh, what is this? This is going to be same as ooh, probability of A intersection B complement over probability of B complement is what I have. And what you have on the numerator is ooh, probability of A minus probability of A intersection B over uh, 1 minus probability of B. So, I, you know, I just used one of the a definition there. Where was it? The second one. There you go. Sure, so, and I was given that this is uh, independent. So probability of A, probability of B, I can convert the intersection into product, not all the time, only for the independence. Then I can factorize by the probability of A on the top, and then what you notice is that I can actually divide it. So it's going to cancel it out. So I have probability of A is what I have. Okay. So yeah, that, uh, oh, oops, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was meant to say probability of A, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I approved it. Okay. That's great. And you can try yourself whether you can prove the second and third one. I'll leave it as an exercise. But, you know, it's a very, very nice practice. Why? It really asks you to use all the things that we have done together. Okay. So, you know, I've attached the slide there, so please check yourself. And yeah, you know, I think this question is also very nice. Let's have a look at this. So what I mean by that is the following. Sure. So if I look at this one, what I notice is that, um, sure, so for this one, if what I notice is that um, I need to find the probability of D, right? And there are many, many ways of doing this. But you really want to think about the given information. So what I mean by thinking about the given information is that you are given probability of C. And I'm given C given D, C given D prime. Okay, just think about, think, think about yourself. Think about yourself. What I mean by that is uh, what law am I going to use? I'm given C and I'm given a bunch of C given D and C given D prime. That really reminds me of working with the who? Law of total probability. So what I mean by that is I have a probability of C. And then, you know, by the definition of law of total probability, it's the same as a C given D prime times probability of D prime or probability of C given D times probability of D. That's what I have, right? That's the definition. And I'm looking for D, so I'm going to call it as X. So then I can just use the information here, you know. It's going to be C given D prime, so 3 over 7. 
and d prime was u, 1 minus x, and c given d is a 6 over 13, and d is simply x. Aha, uh -huh. then the property of c was given. So it's a linear equation, right? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. I want you to try yourself, you know, it's pretty straightforward. And, you know, a question like part two, what are you going to use? I'm going to use D Morgan's law, meaning I, I would like to do the probability of a C intersection D complement would be a lot better to start with. And then one minus probability of a C and D is what you're going to do. And for that one, of course, you can use the intersection definition, meaning you can do either C given D, D, or you can do probability of D given C times C. Either way is fine, but you can use this to find the probability, okay? So actual answer, I want you to try yourself, but just a you know, quick example to demonstrate why knowing the formula matters, okay? Sure, sure. So I've written down all the, all the example there. It's good. Yeah, you know, I really want you to quickly see if I'm given A and B independent. Sure, you know, I'm given fancy conditional probability, but it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? You are already given the fact that that's going to be the same as A and B. And also, you proved above if A and B are independent, A prime and B or A and B prime or A prime B prime, they are independent. So what's the benefit of doing this? Well, because I have union, I, I use the additional law. For that one, you can actually convert into the product. Why? Because we just proved above if A and B are independent or their complements to each other, it's also going to be, what is it, independent. So you can actually solve it a lot quicker. So knowing the formula matters. Sure, sure. So, you know, I think this is also a brilliant example. Why I'm saying that this is a uh, brilliant example is because I, it gives you another sort of approach for solving a problem, you know, when it's not so easy to come up with the right formula and you're dealing with a bunch of conditional probability, so it's maybe better to work with the tree diagram. It is maybe better to work with the tree diagram. So what I mean by that is that, um, you know, what do you want to start with if it's A given B, right? I want to start with B and then B prime. And I'm going to go with who? A and A prime is what I've got. And from there, you know, I'm going to indicate the probability. It's going to be two-thirds and one-third. And, you know, A given B is uh, 5 over 6 and 1 over 6. And A prime given B prime is 1 over 4. So then you can work out the A given B prime automatically because all those trees need to add up being 1. Then it's a lot easier for you to solve now, right? Because... For the first one, you can do the law of total probability. You can add them all. It's great. And for B given A, it's going to be A intersection B over probability of A. Then you can just multiply these two and divide by the A that you have found, right? So if it's struggling to find the right formula with a bunch of conditional probability, maybe it's a good way to go with the tree diagram. Okay, that's great. So I want you to try all these nice questions by yourself and and, and see what answer you can come up with, okay? So yeah, this is a one exam question. I, I think it's brilliant because it also uses a lot of, uh, uh, what is it, law of total, total probability. It, it makes my point valid that the probability algebra is really just a simultaneous equation. You know, what can you substitute? Sure, you know, if, if a question asks show that and then goes up to the next problem, so you really, really want to use it. Okay, so without hesitation, I know I'm going to convert the union with, into the following four. You know what I mean? So let me just use that. Is what I've got as a four over nine. Okay, that's great. And I'm looking for A, so maybe I'm going to call this as an X. I don't know him. Okay, and for the second version, I want you to remember, you know, probability of A, Intersection B can be described as a probability of A given B times B or B given A times A. Okay, so what I mean by that is this version can be described in this this or that, but you know because I'm given B given A uh, B given A prime, I'm going to describe this as a probability of B given A prime times U. Who, who do you need to multiply to complete into to complete for the intersection? You're absolutely right. I'm gonna go with probability of A prime. Right, that's great. So here it's going to be, what is it? 1 over 6 times A prime would be 1 minus X and boom, it's a, again a linear equation, right? Easy. I want you to try yourself and see if you get 1 third and follow for part B. But it's really just coming up with the right formula in the right time. Doo -doo -doo. So yeah, you know, one thing that I want to show you is that this is the same representation for the Venn diagram. Do not just work with the first version. Make sure you're aware of the second version. Why? Because you want to use it for who? Law of total probability, a very, very important rule. Very, very important rule. Why? Because it's going to be extended to for who? Base theorem. Okay, so, you know, 
Bayes' theorem is really just about who? Total probability and tree diagram. So you really, really want to write down the tree diagram well. So in this problem, uh, how would you, which one would you like to start first? It depends on the question. It says, random, random select student from the university taking statistic find the proof that student is female. Okay, so you know, you should be able to put the probability symbol. You should be able to put the probability symbol on that worthy part. So what I mean by that is uh, I'm looking for who? Female, given statistic. Okay, that's my aim. And now let's try to describe the, uh, what is it? The sentence. It says, I'm talking about the female or male. Then we have 0 0.65 and 0 0.35. That's great. And then what do I do? I'm taking statistic, no stats, etc. Okay, that's great. Okay, then, uh, you know, for that, uh, what am I going to do? Only 25%, so it's going to be 0 0.25, 0 0.75, okay? And then for the male, what does it do? 0 0.6 and 0 0.4. So I've completed my, I completed my tree diagram. So for that one, on this part here, what I want to do is this is a probability of who? Female and stat over probability of stat, okay? So here, female and stat, what I want to do is to use the tree diagram and law of total probability. So it's going to be simply 0 0.65 times 0 0.25. Over now for the stats. Yes, that's the room for the total probability, isn't it? So I'm going to do the same thing as the top. But on top of that, I also need to add by who? Male statistics student. So 0 0.75, sorry, 35 times 0 0.6. So Bayes' theorem is really just extensive tree diagram and what the total probability, okay? Easy peasy, and let's go easy. Uh, uh, yeah, sure, it, it is in the syllabus, right? It is in the syllabus. Some, some book says it's an AI. I don't know why they did that. Maybe they will change it later. But if you quickly go back to the, um, sure, okay? Um, the syllabus A413 goes with who? Bayes' theorem, okay? That's great. So that runs through the probability, okay? Now, what are we going to go over? We're going to go over the random variables. We're going to talk about the discrete as well as continuous. All right, let's have a look at the statistic. Starting from the discrete random variable. I mean, you know, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Only thing that I want you to remember any distribution you're dealing with for the discrete or continuous, make sure you're aware of what the PDF, CDF, expected value, and variance. As long as you know how to work with them, I'm sure you're good to go. Okay, so if I quickly um, talk about several things, yeah, sure, uh, median um, um, of this random variable often disregarded uh, to memorize. So please make, su make sure you know how to find the median using the cumulative distribution. This F stands for the cumulative. So you're looking for the least value of uh, um, X that will make the cumulative just become the uh, bigger than half. Okay, obviously, you know, if you add all the probability, it's going to become one, but I'm just looking for the least number of times I need to add so that it's going to be just uh, become bigger than half. Okay, and sure, you know, you know, you know the drill. Finding the coefficient um, on in the distribution is just to plug all of them, plug all of them, and make, make them uh, add up to one by the axiom of probability. So if I go, you know, k times three, k times four, k times five, this to be added up to one, then you can solve it. Right, easy peasy. I'm not going to talk too much on that, but yes, expect a value. Please know how to work with them. And furthermore, what's the application with the expected value? You're absolutely right. The fairness, right? The expected value needs to be zero. If you're dealing with a model and you want to find um, the fair game, make sure their expected value is a zero. Okay. And also, yeah, algebra with expected value. Uh, for example, if you have a, like, let's say, um, expected value of x cubic. How do we find it? It's going to be sigma x cubic probability distribution, okay? And yeah, you know, we talked about that before. Constant will come out as it is, etc, etc. So this is the form, uh, typical linear combination of expected value. Expected value. So please make sure that you're aware of it. Easy peasy, number squeezy. So, you know, then you can apply all the definition here for the x square. You need to come up with the x square. So 1, 0, 1, 4, 9. Do not ever change anything on the probability that that needs to remain the same so here is going to be sigma x i squared probability and for this one i can do the algebra of expected value again so it's going to be e of x squared plus three times expected value of x minus one right make sure expected value of negative one 
is negative one, it's good to go. Yes, variance should that this was a definition, but there's a second version, right? What was it? E of x squared minus mu squared is more uh, popular to be used, so make sure you are aware of that formula as well. The algebra of your variance, make sure you are also um, not only aware, make sure you memorize that. Okay, so something that I would strongly encourage you. So for this one, you know, how I'm going to do is a 16 times the variance of x. And for standard deviation, is a square root of the variance. It's, uh, everything is going to be positive. So and imagine there was a 3 minus 2x. Let's say that it's going to come out as a 2 times standard deviation of x. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So, you know, I'm just like sort of scanning through it because... Like I said before, I'm just quickly reminding you what what things to be care uh, you need what things you need to be careful about or things to memorize. But for the actual questions, I'm not going to solve it. It's going to take too much time. But just and also details of those questions, I typed it. So so go through and have a look. Okay, easy peasy, let me squeeze it. But yes, another application of the discrete random variable. Oh yeah, by the way, one one thing about the discrete random variable probability of x let's say less than two or three for the discrete random variable you need to convert that as what x less than equal to two right what if i had a probability of x um, bigger than equal to four then we know this is the same as one minus probability of x less than four but for the use of calculator i'm going to go one minus probability of x less than equal to three so for the discrete random variable less and less than equal to they are different why am i specifying for the discrete because for the continuous random variable, it doesn't matter. Are we going to talk about that soon? So binomial, again, like I said before, any distribution you're studying, it's all about PDF, CDF, expected value, and the variance. You know what I'm saying? So as long as you are aware of those formula, you're good to go. No problem. No harm done. But yeah, this is a great example. So here's the thing. Binomial is the only distribution. They don't tell you that it's distributed binomially. They sometimes do, but they seldom do. Okay. So you need to pick up that it is uh, the binomial, and how we pick it up is that yeah, you know it's a bare neutral that the uh, the probability is fixed to be either there is only success or failure, and also you know uh, the the fixed number of trials. So I so you know what I want you to grow your habit is when I'm, whenever you're de dealing with the statistic is that you specify your random variable. What are you counting? Yeah, I'm counting. Uh, the questions. So I know that's discrete. It could be binomial. I don't know if it's binomial. But I do realize that it is binomial because I have a fixed number of trial and fixed probability of success. You know, guessing the correct answer out of four would be just one over four. So from that point, I'm aware that this is a binomial. But, you know, it's not stated often. So make make sure you're able to see that. Okay. Then blah, blah, blah. You know, more than 10, correct? It's, it's going to be impossible almost, right? So probability of who? x uh, bigger than 10 but i prefer putting into the less than equal to for the use of calculator so 1 minus probability of x less than equal to 10 is all i gotta say okay but yeah i think you know the, the reason i said this is a nice problem is because i want to associate with part c okay so i define my x as uh guessing the what is it questions right so we have that here okay uh that's great and i found the probability of success there now I want to look at the part C. It says, well, suppose that five students guess the answers to the test, and what is the probability that at least two of them get more than ten answers correct? Okay. I want you to sit back and answer to yourself. What am I counting here? Am I counting the number of students, or am I counting the number of the questions? You're absolutely right. I'm talking about the number of students. I'm counting number of students. So I'm going to go with Y distributed um, so, you know what, I don't know if it's a binomial, so I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to choose number of students. So I want you to notice that if I introduce the new random variable, why? Because I'm counting something else. I'd like to talk about its distribution. Here, okay, what is? Number of students is fixed. It's a five of them. And what else is fixed? My condition for me to choose a particular student is based on uh, uh, the probability that they're guessing more than 10 answers, which is derived from the random variable x. So this is probability of success is coming from the random variable x, which was talking about the number of questions guessed correctly. So as you can see, the, the probability that you have derived there is going to be used there. So, you know, for the binomial, things can be mixed is the point that I'm trying to make. Binomial distribution uses the probability of success, and that success can come, can come from another distribution, such as binomial or later on, normal distribution okay so this is the thing that i want you to be careful so if you define it well then you can say okay 
then probability of root at least 2. So y bigger than or equal to 2. But I prefer working with the less than or equal to, so I'm going to go with 1 minus, uh, what is it? Uh, probability of y less than or equal to, what do you think? Yes, 1. Make sure you, you see how things changed because this is this current variable. Okay, the normal distribution, easy peasy, lemon squeezy, just a symmetric. Um, but you know, just to remind you, uh, on paper one, you know, they could, they're gonna they could give you u to the power negative one over two x square, and find the inflection point. And it's a very popular example, so I just want to show the shape. And also, I want you to memorize this probability. If it's one sigma away, two sigma away, three sigma away from the mean, what the probabilities are, it's going to be always the same. And if you ask me, do I really have to memorize this? Well, may maybe you don't need to, but it's certainly definitely going to help you because the you, you might notice that the, the probability, the CDF they're asking on the normal might be just like a one sigma away. Then you can you don't have to use calculator. You just know that it's 68.26%. Okay, that's good. Yeah, you know, I don't do not regard the normal distribution is only suitable for paper two. It can also definitely come from the paper one. And what I want you to always be careful here is just draw, just draw the normal distribution, symmetric curve, right? Bell's curve. And in the middle, please indicate the mu. That's all you gotta do, right? Make make sure you don't think that the normal distribution is only suitable for paper two, it is also suitable for paper one as well. Okay. And the given that blah 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 that let's say that the probability here was p okay then you know mu minus five is p no problem and you know mu uh, plus five is a symmetric so this is gonna mu plus five then you realize it's just same as p no problem and for that conditional probability will be intersection over probability of x bigger than mu minus five right so now you see if it's intersection um, bigger than mu minus five and less than so you realize this part only. So that's going to be from 1 minus 2p, isn't it? Over, if it's bigger than uh, mu minus p, then it's just everything but p here. So it's going to be 1 minus p. So you know, I'm just showing you an example of a paper 1 style. It uses a symmetry, okay? Things like that. You know, what I like to do is always make sure you try to draw the Bell's curve. And in the middle, what do I indicate? You're absolutely right. I'm going to indicate the mu, okay? It says, oh, it's a bit li little tricky, isn't it? 2 mu minus x, hmm. Okay, what do I do? Well, you know, let's indicate the x. It can be in the negative, it can be on the left, it can be on the right, it's up to you. It is really up to you, because at the end of the day, it's gonna be the same, because things are symmetric. So you know what, let me call it x here, and I'm gonna call this a probability k. Okay, and where can I indicate them? Well, then you know, the distance you travel here is how much? It's uh, mu minus x, isn't it? Okay, all right, then, if I go mu minus x further to the right, it's going to give you the symmetric point, which is ooh, 2 mu minus x. So, no, you know, it's not that bad. It is not that bad. So just make sure you use a symmetry. So now it's pretty straightforward. You know, you if you want just this probability, you just have to subtract from k. Okay? That's it. Um, yeah, you know, I, you can check this one by yourself, but I like to talk about this one by adding a new slide. Sure, let's have a look at this one. So what I want you to do is just just a sketch. What? Symmetric curve, you know what I mean? And then, uh, you know, uh, here it wasn't given the mu or sigma, so what I like to do is maybe just use the standardized one, right? No problem, it is normal distribution as well. Boom, right? Then, um, you know, this is a representation for the inverse norm, isn't it? So if I call it k, k, so you're literally looking at what? Uh, probability of x less than or equal to k is x. So maybe I'm going to indicate there, you know. So this is k. Then I have this to be who? That will be the x, isn't it? That's correct. So, you know, if I call this as a maybe p, then I have a probability of x less than or equal to p is uh, 1 minus x, right? But here's the thing, you know, if you actually see it's an x and 1 minus x would have been this x and then subtract by that, right? So now I have, what is it here? being a p but then you know this needs to be x so that the cdf less than equal to p is going to give you one minus x well hold on a sec they're symmetric so they are they should be symmetric as well they're actually plus minus to each other so simply should become zero okay so i just wanted to show you some nice paper one style normal distribution before we talk about the paper two style Okay, so you know, then you know, if you have a mu and sigma, you should be very confident being able to solve the normal distribution. It's absolutely fine, and you know, grow the habit of defining what you're measuring or counting. So time taken. So okay, 
is what is it puzzle time for puzzle this is what i'm gonna st i'm gonna write okay make sure you always indicate what the variable is so i'm gonna go x is distributed normally am i given mean yes am i given standard deviation yes you know that's brilliant so you know that's what I have, that's what i have and uh, blah, blah, blah. at least at least my friend so it's gonna be probability of x bigger than equal to 30 and uh, here's the thing on the disk and then variable we are very careful of this bigger than equal to because when we do the one minus uh, 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 with the, if I try to convert for the one minus we have to reduce the number by one wasn't it so imagine that it was a binomial distribution then uh, probability of u, y bigger than equal to 30 would have been the same as one minus probability of y less than equal to 29 however if I look at the random variable x what I notice is what probability of x bigger than equal to 30 remember it's continuous random variable and what I notice is what doesn't matter if you contain the point or not the probability is going to be still the same so in fact this is the same as 1 minus probability of x less than 30 but also same as probability of x less than equal to 30 it's the same thing so you gotta be able to distinguish between the discrete and continuous okay so that's my point so here you know I'm gonna just use that and let me delete and the next thing is yeah sure for part b i want you to read it carefully and also always make sure when you, whenever you're doing the random variable it doesn't matter if it's discrete or continuous make sure what you're counting define what you're counting here i'm counting what students so i'm gonna go y distributed who different thing right now i'm talking about students and you know discrete could be associated with the binomial and certainly so because i have what X number of trial and what's gonna be the probability that I choose that person choose that student is based on the time it took for them to complete the puzzle and that is coming from what the random variable X thank you so you know so previous example we did the binomial binomial this is a binomial and normal the probability of success is coming from the normal distribution that I'm applying to new random variable with the binomial okay then you can use easy peasy right so I'm gonna do at most half so probability of y less than equal to 5 is what I'm going to do. So make, sh make, sh make, sh make sure whenever you're dealing with the um, random variable, define what you're counting and coming up with the correct distribution is the key. Sure, sometimes, you know, it's not given with the mu and sigma, no problem. What we can do is to standardize, isn't it? Okay, so this probability is going to be literally the same as probability of z less than equal to 20 minus mu over sigma is 0 0.1. And then that one is going to be a probability of u z less than equal to 29 minus mu over sigma is equal to 0 0.85. Notice that I convert into the less than equal to and then try to apply the inverse norm on it, right? So it's going to be inverse norm of 0 0.1 is going to be 20 minus mu over sigma. And then similar thing, right? So inverse norm of 0 0.85. Make sure you put the probability. And yeah, you know, this time I'm going to put the mu as a 0 sigma is 1 because I standardized right that's the whole point you know because if you want to use the inverse norm you got to have a mu and sigma I don't have it for x no problem I convert into the z and then use it okay so it's going to be what is it uh, 29 minus mu over sigma then you can solve it simultaneously I mean this is just a linear equation with two variables right easy peasy lemma squeezy sure you know things like this is the typical example that you'll be seeing right what I mean by that is if you look at part A, you know, weight is given by the normal distribution, but I don't have a mu and sigma. So I got to do the standardization and find the mu and sigma, right? And if you look at part B, now I'm not measuring weight. I'm what? Counting the sparrows. And for that one, what distribution are you going to use? I'm going to use binomial, where the fixed number of trials is 5 and probability of success is coming from who? The normal distribution. So this mixed distribution is very, very popular, almost like all the questions, especially for section B on paper too. Okay, so make sure you are aware of it. Okay, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Let's have a look at the continuous random variable. So, you know, it's just really just a formula for the integration. It's really checking whether you're able to differentiate or integrate. That's it, right? So, you know, a typical question like that, K, to find the K, instead of adding like a discrete random variable, what we're going to do is to integrate, right? So I'm going to integrate from 0 to 2, k times x squared, 2 minus x dx should be who? 1, then boom, I'm going to have k being 1 over sigma 0 to 2, blah, blah, blah. You can measure it. So it's really your skills for the integration. How would you integrate this? How would you integrate this? Yes, by just expanding, right? 2x cubic, um, sorry, 2x squared, 
minus x cubic and just do the polynomial integration okay please check yourself easy peasy lemon squeezy oh yeah I like this uh, problem here why I'm saying I like this problem is because it is um, you can do the integration but you know you can do uh, just algebra what I mean by that is a uh, I have t ft and I've got the absolute value function so the x intercept is 2 t intercept t intercept is 2 right is this a good picture for that function no right make sure you're what aware of the interval it goes only from who one to three isn't it okay so make sure you restrict the bounds not only for the continuous random variable for for the function in general right and it says into quartile range okay so which is the difference between the third and first isn't it and 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 what we know is uh that function up to the third quartile should give you three over four things like that but I want you to realize it because it's symmetric by the nature. 2 is going to be our median. So my first quartile is lying around there, isn't it? And that area shaded should give you 1 over 4. That's great. So, you know, what I can do is maybe just instead of integrating, I can work with the trapezoid. You know what I mean? So, you know, if I put 1 there, that's going to be 1. If I put Q there, that's going to be... By the way, this is a piecewise function, so this is actually 2 minus t. So this point here is going to be 2 minus q1. Then, you know, it's just a plus b times h divided by 2 should be quarter is how you can work with. So either you can use the integration or area, doesn't matter. But, you know, my point here is make sure you respect the bounds. You can also know the formula. Sure, sure, no problem, right? And... Uh, you, yeah, you know, it's, you, you're going to get a lot of piecewise function for the continuous random variable. Don't, don't forget, you know, to not panic. So what I can do is, you know, 0 to 4, 0 to pi, sorry, for the sine x is going to look like that with the amplitude of a 1 over 4, isn't it? And then it's going to be a linear function with the x intercept being who, pi, and okay. So it looks like that, but only up to who, uh, 2 pi. Okay, that's great, right? That is great. Um, then you notice if you integrate this, you know, that was 1 over 2. So, you know, uh, what is? Pi is a median. Then you realize, okay, the, the remaining piece from pi to 2 pi, a x minus pi, should compensate for the rest of the probability, 1 over 2. Then you can find the a easily. Okay, I mean, you found the median already. So, But I'm just saying piecewise function, make sure uh, you try to sketch separately and see what you get yeah the mean what is it it's going to be um x times fx dx however it's different pieces so you, you're going to go with from zero to pi for the sine x isn't it so if i just rewrite it's going to be from zero to pi x over four sine x dx uh, plus pi to two pi what do i do uh, a times x times x minus pi dx so that would have been the mean and what would have been the variance sure if this was given as mu, I'm sure this is paper two, okay? So what I'm going to do is simply just what? Increase the degree by two, right? So increase the degree by one. So it's a x squared times fx dx minus mu squared, right? So minus mu squared is going to be your variance, okay? Yeah, you know, respect the bounds. I'm sure it's going to be like the in the middle of uh, both of them, right? As you can see. So yeah, it's going to be from pi over 2 to pi, I will go with the sine x, you know, and then what is it, from pi to 3, pi over 2, yeah, I'm going to go with the linear, that's that, okay, make sure you check on the bounds. Sure, conditional probability is also very popular for the continuous random variable, either with the probability density function or normal distribution, probability of who, pi, x, 2 pi, given pi over 2, right, so all you got to do is just describe well with the intersection, you know what I mean? Sure, probability of blah, and in the middle, what am I going to put? The intersection. That's great. And, you know, if you think about the intersection there, you know, what do you reckon? Um, if I just visualize, I have a pi to 2 pi, boom. And then what is it? Oops, pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, boom. So the intersection is going to be, the right, uh, pi 3 pi over 2 is what I have. Okay, so that goes with the continuous random variable. Obviously, you know, there are many types of questions, but I just want to, Talk about the essential skills. Don't forget the bounds. Make sure you know how to integrate. This is, even though this is statistic, really it's just integration skills. You know, things can come with integration by parts. Things can come from integration by substitution, etc. So make sure you are aware of it. Okay. So that goes with the topic four. You know, topic four. It's it's hard to like summarize because it really depends on you know how the worthy question is gonna come up. 
you know, things can, even though I just briefly went over disk random variable, it can be something with the permutation combination, you know, it can be something with the counting. So it, there are many, many variations of questions, but fundamentally, yes, you're working with the PDF, CDF, expected value and variance, but to get that PDF, you might have to do different things. You might just have to add them up or sometimes counting, permutation, who knows. But that those details, you got to go through with the questions. Okay, that's it for me today. I will see you around.